All right, welcome back to the Move to Babel podcast. This week, you've got myself, Colin, and I'm joined by Nick and Brennan. How are you guys doing? Hey, that's me. How's it going, guys? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, how about you, Colin? How's things? It's uh, it's going. It's been a pretty good week. Uh, you know, Mortal Kombat comes out at the end of the week, so I get to watch people get their arms frozen off. So, <laughs> got a lot to look forward to here. And get watch people get stabbed with frozen blood. Is that what is that what happens in that movie? Is that a thing that happens? Uh, I'm excited for the chaos. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, um, there is one place where you will not be able to watch Mortal Kombat uh, this coming week. Uh, and that is the Arclight and Cinerama Dome, uh, which would, it was announced that they were shutting down. Um, as of yet, there has yet to be a buyer announced um, or any kind of like solidified plan to kind of restart these. And I mean, uh, talking about the Cinerama Dome specifically, I mean, this is a, a very iconic theater. Uh, so we're all big Once Upon a Time in Hollywood fans. Um, it has a little cameo there. Um, it's been featured in movies quite a lot because this is such a just a big place for for movies <laughs> it's hard to to put it in any more complex way than that yeah it's there's a part of la movie going culture that seems it's re, it seems really annoying because everyone's really excited to, t- to tell you about it but uh it's it's this is a big loss just for movies and movie theater going in general it's it's a real bummer it's it's a it's a it's an historical landmark you can't get much more classic than that in terms of theaters i feel like it's like this and the chinese theater are kind of on the same level as each other uh, it's just it's a bummer and you have all the arc light cinemas too which are going and there's i mean there might, there might be a good chance that the cinerama dome comes back in some capacity but who knows about those other theaters too it's just I feel like Brennan and I were on here last week talking about how great Kong's doing, and then all of a sudden we're kind of just kid they just kick us back down again. So um, it's it's rough. It's not great. Yeah, it's it's a sad thing for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm I'll be the optimist and and hope that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I think a lot of obviously there's no concrete plan for anything, but um, a lot of just what I'm reading into and even the city and a lot of the city planners, just from what they say, they feel like there's gotta be something that happens to these theaters, especially the center dome, but there's gotta be something that happens here um, at some point to keep these theaters open in some capacity. Um, it's just kind of weird. I mean, obviously not every theater in LA is gone. No, no question. Mm-hmm. Like that's just not a thing, but it's weird to think of the capital of the uh, movie going kind of, or the capital of, of kind of film worldwide. LA is kind of uh, losing its most iconic theater. See, here's my thing. Uh, two years ago, everyone thought that drive-in cinemas were completely dead, that there was no hope for them. And uh, last year, they were like the only way people saw movies. So anything can happen. Um, I'm not giving up hope. I, and I think because this is such an iconic location, um, and we can, we can get into some of just the actual legal preservation there is, um, for the Cinerama Dome, like the, the building itself is not going anywhere. It's just what the future uses of it um, will be are, are pretty up in the air as of right now. Yeah, there's a really interesting stat that I read. I think it was in the Variety Report where this was uh, announced first, where there's something like $900 million were made just in LA from theaters last year. And 11% of that was from Arclight in the Cinerama Dome, which is nuts. So there are some like really big business implications of this. Cause I think one of the big things that why AMC and Regal and all these places are still really struggling is because your LA's, your New York's, your San Francisco's are still kind of, they're still not in a great spot with the virus. And that's where a lot of their income comes from box office receipts and whatnot. Uh, so this really has a big effect just in, in terms of like, yeah, it's really sad that the Cinerama Dome may not be around in its current state or anything like that. But in terms of like the long longevity of movie theaters in general, we've been tracking this for so long, but it's, it's a really, it's not a great blow at all. Like a lot of studios really need this money. So I don't really know how they're going to work around that. It's tough. I mean, it's, it's certainly sad. Um, I, I was still, I was still kind of hold out for for some sort of hope at the end of this. I just can't see them really going away. And even just because Cinerama Dome is a historical landmark, it can't be really knocked down. It can't like you can change the inside, but there, there, there's 
just a lot of precedent there, and it will take a long time for anything to actually happen if they don't decide to keep it as a theater. So, I mean, they're entering onto that there. And there's even a petition going around now that's just passing 16,000 in now about six, seven days. I remember I was, I think it was the 98th person to sign it. So I'm feeling proud that it's <laughs> pumping those numbers up there. So um, I'm going to ask Colin to put that in the article just for fun, just to maybe see if we can get some more signatures on that, just to kind of save the Cinerama Dome. Um, Colin, I saw a, a picture um, that made me like a little bit uh, nostalgic there. The Cinerama Dome, I think it was the Shrek premiere. They put the Shrek <laughs> head on it. Pretty cool. Um, it's just sad. I mean, it's it's a sad thing, but I do hope that it can it can be revived in some capacity. Yeah. Didn't I, they put uh, the minions? <laughs> didn't they put the minions on there too? Or they put they painted it like yellow or whatever and put the weird Google eyes on it? Yeah, and I thought I saw a photo. Happened? I thought I saw a photo of Jaws coming out of the top as well. Something like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> just it's neat. So there's it's been painted or not painted, but it's been wrapped with the Shrek ears. Um, there was Spider Man crawling on it for Spider Man Two, the Minions. Um, I think really that's the biggest selling point for anybody that's looking to buy is what can you wrap this dome in? <laughs> um, you know, you could, uh, you know, F Nine is coming out in a couple months. You turn the dome into Vin Diesel's head, or you just make it a big smiling uh, Martin Scorsese face. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> the patron saint of this podcast. <laughs> mm. I feel like most of the potential is in how you can think, think of all the marketing potential. That's how we need to get people in on this. Just, just plaster yeah. it with uh, different, different icons. And I think we're good. Yeah. It's, I really, I mean, I guess we can get into who we think should buy it or who's in a good position to buy it, but I just want this to stick around. I, I mean, I've never really been in the LA theater scene, but it just looks like it's really fun. And it's, Stuff like the Cinerama Dome is a lot of. I mean, it's it sounds kind of like bullshit, but it's a lot of the it's a lot of the reasons why we have some of these filmmakers now, like your Tarantinos and your Edgar Wrights and Ryan Johnsons, who are really championing cinema and why they got into it in the first place is because they had these special experiences like this, and so many other filmmakers that way too, where they got their start by just having a really cool experience in a theater. So it's just like it's another way. It's another way where this can't happen i guess in the future if things continue to go down but uh, it's just it's a bummer i'm feeling a little sen sentimental about it even though i've <laughs> never been there <laughs> yeah and i i i don't think this will apply to arc light but i think at least for the cinerama dome i think it's probably going to be a streamer if anybody steps in to buy it um just as a movie theater to, to keep it basically as is because we've seen um attempts by like Amazon has made it pretty well known. Disney's made it pretty well known um, that they do want a, a larger stake in the theater game. And I mean, the way Disney just kind of blackballs people <laughs> in the theater chains anyways, Disney basically runs every theater chain right now as is just because they demand ridiculous amounts of the gross um, to put their films in. But I could really see someone like a Netflix or like an Amazon prime studios coming in and buying this theater so that they have, a place specifically for their content, um, especially if you have content that wouldn't necessarily get like a wider theatrical release um, that, that you would throw up there. Um, and because of just the way the, the laws have been changed within the past couple of years, um, theaters have that option. Uh, so quick history lesson for anybody listening. Uh, um, so theaters, theater, uh, or sorry, not theaters, uh, producers and used to be able to act as their own distributors. Um, in terms of the theatrical lease, and there were a whole lot of issues with monopolies, uh, which this country tends to uh, have a lot of problems with. And so basically the Supreme Court came in about 100 years ago and said there needs to be a distinct line between uh, content producers and content distributors as far as theatrics goes. Um, and so Disney hasn't owned AMC or Warner Brothers hasn't owned a theater chain um, for over 100 years because of that law. Um, so now that law is gone as of 2019, I think. So in theory, um, a streamer or a producer or a Disney could come in and buy a theater and start uh, basically being their own exhibitor. Yeah, we've seen Netflix come in and buy the Egyptian. and They bought somewhere else, too. I can't remember what is the top of my head, but it would just be such a bummer to see Disney come and buy this. And then all we'd have to do is watch Mulan in theaters. You know, like that would be such a bummer. I I don't really like the idea of any of these streamers coming in because, like you said, there's 
monopoly um, stuff going on there. But also, it's just that's just not how theaters work in my mind. It's just it's it further would remove the chance of some indie coming out and coming out of nowhere and making a big impact. It's it's a lot harder when Disney can just throw in all of their movies into all these different theaters. That would be that'd be a that'd be a tough beat. <laughs> Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I'd like to see uh a big name director pick it up, that'd be cool, but I, I don't know if any are kind of viable to do that. I know Quentin saved uh Tarantino saved the uh what was it, the old Beverly is, is what it's called? The new Beverly. New Beverly. Well, not the old go. one, the new one. <laughs> the new one. So we saved that theater which is in LA. So I mean there is potential there, but you gotta have some big bucks uh to do it. Um I know someone who made some big bucks recently, but uh we won't talk about that. <laughs> what ryan johnson <laughs> <laughs> you outed him but uh yeah i mean i'm sure there are just a handful of people that individuals that could go and do this sort of thing but i'd love to see uh, a collective group of people come together and do something i think that'd be pretty neat you see like five or six big name people come together maybe with an organization try to pick this thing up uh that'd be inspiring and nice to see who knows what'll happen so basically, you're asking for the portal scene from Avengers Endgame, but it's like Martin Scorsese and Tarantino <laughs> and Steven Spielberg all <laughs> shuffling out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I hope I don't see George Lucas come out of there. So the others are. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's just kind of sad. It's it's a big, it, it's a big location. It's iconic. And, and now it's at least it appears so for now going away, uh, which is not very fun. So we'll move on to slightly happier stuff. Um, At least nothing else that's closing. Um, So there's a movie out called In the Earth uh, that I have not seen, but I understand uh, you guys want to talk about a little bit. So let's go ahead and dive into that. Yeah, In the Earth is a movie I saw back at Sundance this year, and it's the new movie from Ben Wheatley, who has done a lot of weird genre bending movies in his past, Kill List and High Rise and all these other weird movies, but uh, he's been recently tapped to do a lot of weird blockbustery stuff. So his last movie was Netflix's adaptation of Rebecca, and also the remake of Hitchcock's film, and that movie is terrible. It's really, really bad. <laughs> uh, but Ben Wheatley is also supposed to, he's also supposed to go on and direct Tomb Raider two the follow-up to the Tomb Raider movie starring Alicia Vikander that I don't think anyone cared about. And then he's also going to direct The Meg 2, which is such a bizarre choice by him. They're like two blockbusters, or I guess The Meg actually did pretty well, but I don't feel like anyone actually cares about either of those movies very much. So a bizarre turn from him making all these weird, low-budget, trippy, psychedelic horror thriller movies and then going on to make super... Uh, Hollywood schlock but whatever I hope he brings something weird to those movies and makes them a little more interesting but uh, In the Earth is much more in line with his better work I would say it's a really it's a cool return to form for him and I think Neon has it out in a few theaters and also I think it's on premium VOD this week but this was an interesting one because it opened it was one of the it was one of the first productions back from the UK lockdown last last summer so he shot this movie in secret because he was, I think he was working on the script or whatever for, or doing pre-production for Tomb Raider 2. And then that was completely shut down. So he said, okay, I'm going to go out and make this weird horror movie for two weeks in the woods. <laughs> so uh, he got a really small cast together for this one. You have Joel Fry in there and you have Ella Torchio from uh, Midsommar. And basically this movie is about a pandemic. It's, he said it's not quite COVID, but it's a reflection of the COVID times. So basically... Joel Fry is the scientist who goes out into the woods and basically they've lost contact with this other scientist who is studying the the forest and this possible communication system that's happening throughout the roots and all the woods and whatnot, all this weird stuff going on there. But she's disappeared, so Ella Torchia and Joel Fry go out into the woods to try to find her. And then insanity ensues from there. Um I don't really want to spoil much else about this movie, except that it gets very, very strange. And uh, Joel Fry's foot goes through an adventure in this movie where it just keeps getting cut open. And Ben Wheatley loves to do weird things and make his foot go squish time and time again. So um, it's a bizarre movie from there. 
and it gets more crazy and crazy and then like the logic of the movie stops making sense after a while and it's like pretty much intentional because there would be there's there there's scenes where different cameras are used based on what shot is like which uh character is being focused on so they'll go to like a really low res video camera and then it'll go back to like your regular like more cinematic style and in between scenes and it's very jarring and then there's there'll be scenes where they um he like puts in blacks black frames so it'll go it'll cut the black for like a second and then it'll go on to the next scene and it's very weird and then there's a bunch of strobe lights and everything that goes on this movie just gets very very crazy and it's really fun um not gonna so, lie it sounds pretty good i'm gonna i'm gonna check that out it's really wild it's like just an it's just and I have like a hundred minutes of Ben Wheatley just getting really weird in the woods, and it's really cool because it's <laughs> out of all of the like COVID nineteen movies that have been made, I feel like this is one of the better ones because it's not really trying to comment on like our existence within the pandemic itself, but it's just it's taking that idea of a pandemic and just kind of just going. He's just going nuts with it and making it super weird. And there's this guy out in the woods who's just chilling out there. He's really into pagan stuff. And he kind of traps these two scientists and just kind of makes them a part of his pagan rituals. And he has a very sharp axe. (laughs) And so it's a lot of crazy mismatch of stuff that he throws together in this movie that I don't know if it all works. But it's a lot of fun. I encourage people to check it out. I think it definitely is one of the better pandemic movies that we've seen in the past year. And it's a... I think it's probably going to be be a little better than Tomb Raider Two or The Meg Two, <laughs> but it's certainly better than Rebecca. That's for sure. Cause that that movie was terrible. Um, I don't know. He just might be one of these directors who is better with a lower budget. There's a few people like that. I feel like Shyamalan is like that, where if you give him a big budget, he makes After Earth and <laughs> stuff like that. You know, um, but there's a few people like that. I think Taika might be a little like that. Well, maybe not because he did Thor, but he has a lot of ingenuity in his small budgets. But uh, I think this is he's a really interesting director, Ben Wheatley, and I encourage people to check this movie out because you won't see anything like it this year. It's it's wonderfully strange. So everyone should go check that out. Yeah, strobe lights, uh, creepy stuff. I mean, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, if you're a, if you have photosensitivity, you probably don't want to watch this movie because oh, it like gets it gets very. There's one scene in the middle of this movie that gets unbelievably overbearing with its use of strobe lights. It's a really cool scene, but if you are sensitive to any of that kind of stuff, it's probably it's not for you because it would be, it would be really tough to sit through. But it's really cool. I really liked it quite a bit. Nice. Yeah, um, weird stuff in the woods. Ben Wheatley, good job. All I'm saying <laughs> is, if Tomb Raider two, if the title is not spelled T W O M B, Raider, I'm gonna be upset. <laughs> he's so weird. I feel like he's just kind of doing whatever he wants. Like he's doing these weird movies. There's a movie that he made called A Field in England, where it's just people just going like tripping out in, <laughs> in a field in England. <laughs> uh, but then. Hollywood comes calling and says, hey, we'll give you millions of dollars to go make these other movies. And he's a, so he says, okay. So I, I wonder if he's filming these so he can bankroll some of his other weirder movies. But I don't know. It's certainly, In the Earth is a really fun experience. So I hope people check it out. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. I mean, I don't know what the draw is to go and get him to do these big Hollywood movies. But if if they're calling, I mean, how's he, uh, he going to decline, right? Yeah, I just hope it's better than Rebecca because his Rebecca is so bad. It's really <laughs> bad. <laughs> so I don't know. We'll see. Maybe it just didn't have enough strobe light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of strobe lights missing from the very restrained, uh, whatever, 18th century drama that movie is. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and uh, move into what's pretty much going to be our main event for today. Um, so this is the completion over the second round. So we've all picked uh, two movies at this point for the movie Babel Club. Um, and so this week was Brennan's pick with After Hours. Uh, Nick, I believe this is your first Scorsese movie, right? Yeah, first one. I like this guy. He's he makes decent movies. I'm looking forward to. It. Have you guys heard this movie? He's made this movie called Goodfellas. Have you guys heard of this one? I'm looking forward no. to checking that one out next. I've seen B movie, so. 
don't know. Close <laughs> enough. <laughs> Uh, He's that so, guy that made the cameo in uh, Shark Tale, right? Yeah. yeah oh, the, that's where the, I knew the, him from. That's boss, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, Brennan, do you want to uh, talk us through what brought you to After Hours? Certainly. I mean, all jokes aside there, big Scorsese fan. I think we all are. I mean, he's made a lot of good stuff. And just really um, around the Irishman, I, I mean, I had seen a couple of his movies before that, kind of the more mainstream ones. And then it was around that almost two years ago now, a year and a half that that came out, that I kind of wanted to explore a lot of his other movies, and slowly but surely I've been getting through them. Um, And this is one that's always pretty highly praised among, say you look at ranked lists throughout his career, this one's always really high up there from a lot of people. Um, And it kind of strikes me as very interesting. I mean, it's it's one of his shorter movies, right? It's 97 minutes. It's not 200 minutes. Um, (laughs) It's... It's 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 a it's a fast movie. It's certainly um, funny as well. Um, but yeah, so this is just a movie that I want to check out because it's, it's smaller. It's highly praised, and I mean, why not? You want to kind of branch out and see all that Scorsese has to offer, right? I mean, last week I watched Silence for the first time. This week I watched this. Uh, very different movies, and it just shows that he does have range, and it's not all uh, mob flicks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, so you go back to the start of the production on this picture, and it kind of was rooted out of um, Scorsese being a little bit downtrodden. I mean, The Last Temptation of Christ was uh, kind of abandoned by Paramount, and Scorsese was kind of upset with this. And you know what? He he took his anger and he said, let's go make an indie movie. And he put a lot of his focus into uh, indie projects and indie companies, and that's kind of how we came to... um, this picture after hours originally tim burton was set to direct it but scorsese liked the script a lot he got the financial backing and uh burton stepped aside i mean i i want to know what a burton after hours would look like (laughs) i mean it's kind of before he went full burton but like it's mid 80s but i don't know it'd be kind of interesting to see but i'm glad scorsese jumped on this because this was a fantastic movie i'm i'm excited to get into talking about it so let's firstly uh throw to you guys what do you guys think of this uh this movie uh, I yeah, really this is it. the. Um... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was just, it's definitely um a lot different from most of the, you know. I I'm not claiming to be a Scorsese expert, but I've seen a pretty wide variety of of his movies. Um, and it definitely feels a lot different from pretty much any of them. Um, just totally and and even thematically. Um, but I really dig it. It's just this very absurd like adventure um it's it's just our main character trying to get home and these crazy things just keep snowballing and becoming crazier and crazier um and it's just a fun world to explore um just these few neighborhoods of new york that he's hanging around in um after hours hence the title um but yeah i really enjoyed it it was a good time yeah this is the i think this is the second or third time i've seen this movie and uh, big fan Big fan of me. Um, yeah, I just love this movie is, I feel like it's 100 minutes of just great improv logic. And it's kind of mixed with, it's like Murphy's Law, like everything that could possibly happen to this guy it happens. <laughs> it's It all builds and builds and builds on each other. And I really love the screenplay. Everything comes back around. Uh, it's everything that was like a good part in this guy's night. Uh, Paul Hackett played by Griffin Dunn. Uh, everything that, like initially is some like a nice little reprieve for him goes sour everything goes wrong um it's just it's great it's it's a lot of really great energetic filmmaking from marty who i mean he's always energetic but especially in this one like the first shot in this movie is just the camera zooming over Mm. like all the cubicles in the office space and you're just you're just off to the races you're ready to go so yeah um, yeah it's a uh, it's really fun it goes it gets very nutty and i love it yeah so i mean let's just quickly get into that i mean so you got as you said paul hackett the character played by griffin dune who's great here i mean he's he kind of gives off for me like sitcom vibes but like he's really good <laughs> um like he's a fun he, he has a good kind of uh quippy just he has great kind of delivery throughout the film so it is really just him uh, living this crazy night, bouncing from kind of scene to scene, person to person, uh, 
kind of place to place throughout the night and things just get worse and worse and he just wants to get home right like he he's he's thinking he's going to get lucky he meets this girl at a, at a at a coffee shop and he goes way across town to, to meet her and he 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 ends up being out of money things just don't go well for him with the girl they, things just continue to spiral and he just wants to get home and it just somehow he just can't get home and you just kind of with him throughout this kind of screwball thriller comedy type movie um big takeaway too: john hurd and Catherine o'hara being in a movie together right the home alone parents uh <laughs> like six seven eight years before home alone came out that's kind of neat yeah yeah I, f- I feel like this is the ultimate then hijinks ensue movie mm. you know because literally just all right guy meets a girl wants to have a fun night out and then everything goes to shit from there (laughs) you know Uh, it's just there's so many absurd parts of this movie i would love to just talk about this movie for four hours because there's just so many weird little like every scene is so specific and bizarre it's i mean it's no secret that scorsese loves new york city uh he made a movie called new york new york you're josh uh, for god's sake yeah (laughs) but um it's clear that he has such an attention to detail for like for these few blocks that Paul Hackett is on because everything there's so much detail, especially like in the bars and everything like that. It's just this crazy subculture of people and the only people that are up at two, three in the morning. It's fantastic. Weird take by me, but there was this old football coach and I couldn't I just thought of this quote the entire time whenever I watched this movie, but his name's Herm Edwards and he says he coaches like rookies when they come into the NFL on like life advice and he says nothing good happens after 2 p.m or 2 a.m and i just always think of that whenever i watch this movie because <laughs> everything is just going horribly for this guy it's like a horror movie almost yeah it's uh no it's it's just it's it's so good it, it is really good uh colin i think you want to continue on something there yeah so i do want to talk about the cast um because this is a pretty loaded cast um and a lot of these people kind of took off after the movie um this is a just ridiculously good cast for um what's even even by 1985 standards is a pretty small budget pretty small movie um overall because i mean you have griffin dune who's uh probably most known for an american werewolf in london um which also has kind of similar dark comedy vibes although not as uh gory here in after hours um and then you have cheech and chong are both in the movie you have john hurd and Catherine o'hara um you have dick miller uh marty himself has a little cameo um in one of the clubs but you just have oh you have linda florentino uh who uh people of my generation will remember from uh, men in black terry gar from mr mom um like there's just a lot of really strong comedy character actors here and i mean this was one of uh Catherine o'hara's first bigger roles after leaving sctv and, and making her way down south into the u.s um so it's just a really good cast working with a really good script and even things that would normally be pretty dry are just hilarious in this movie because you have these people bringing them to life yeah no 100 percent um it is it is just a really good kind of kind of kind of like you have a bunch of different tools in a toolbox and you take them out you all throw them together and that's kind of what you get with this cast right everyone does their job really well everyone's got strengths that they, that they flex in this film um yeah one of my favorite parts of the movie was i forget the actress's name um but it was yeah terry uh gar there uh, up in her apartment that was <laughs> that was a pretty funny sequence there that's the um that's the kind of the bartender worker there that uh paul hackett goes up and sees that that was a funny little bit there probably one of my favorite of the movie yeah i love the uh the use of foreshadowing when they go up into the first apartment when you're saying out with Roseanne Arquette and it's just the the horrified paper mache <laughs> sculpture. It's like a terrifying like gothic picture. It's like, oh, I, I can't imagine this night's going to go well for this dude <laughs> after seeing that. <laughs> if you want a Scorsese kind of fanboy out a little, uh, did you guys notice his parents at all in the movie? Like no, Scorsese's parents? Yeah, his parents, yeah. Well, his mom makes a lot of cameos, um, and it's at the very beginning whenever um, Griffin Dune's there sitting reading the book, and you see uh, the girl obviously notices him in the cafe right beside uh, Griffin Dune a couple of tables over. It's Marty's parents sitting in the corner drinking coffee, chatting. 
they're the only other two in the in the in the cafe it's pretty cool oh that's really funny huh. yeah i love little stuff like that yeah mark this movie is i have the other the, one of my favorite scenes too is when i forget the actor's name but when he it gets to hang out in the one guy's apartment who's like actually like lets him cool down for a second <laughs> after he <laughs> narrowly escapes the mob and it reminds me of the uh the scene from planes trains and automobiles where um uh what's his face steve martin is finally in fr- is in front of the uh, concierge and he's just like i just want my fucking car so i can go <laughs> fucking home it's like the it's like the one time he finally gets to actually let off all of his pent-up aggression <laughs> he just goes nuts and freaks out it's such, it's such a great scene and it's such a good use of because every time he's about to explain himself in the movie someone else just comes into the scene and torpedoes all of that like yeah. when he's um when he's about to go home and after going um after getting the uh, keys for John Hurd, like, he's like, oh, like he's like going to help him out anyway, open up the register, and then he learns that the girlfriend died, right? <laughs> and it's just literally everything, it's, it's, the movie's almost like, it feels like it's toying with you because it feels mm-hmm. like if something, if one thing goes differently, this movie ends in like 15 minutes, you know? But it just, like, something just comes in and swoops in at the last second to make, to take this on an even crazier route and just make it descend further and further into this kind of hell there's a lot of there's like there's some fun like religion metaphors in allegories when you look at it that way it's uh, yeah it was great where did you guys watch this by the way i didn't want to plug that in to the pod so i was on hbo max okay. yeah same okay yeah so i just had a free rental by stacking up points by different things so i had that here in canada but yeah hbo max that's good uh pretty accessible then for uh you guys um yeah, I do hope more people check this out, though. I mean, obviously, it's a pretty highly watched movie now, but I mean, for people that are just kind of getting into film or for people that are um, maybe want to explore his filmography a lot more, I think this is one you should go to pretty early um, just to kind of see the range that he's got and just to kind of see something very different from what we're used to in a uh, in a Scorsese movie. I feel like this is a movie that a lot of guys like. <laughs> um, it's just, I mean... Scorsese, he literally, his entire career is exploring masculinity. So, like, I can see why guys would like his movies. But this one especially, it's just, I feel like there's a big hive of After Hours people and they're all dudes. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what that I don't know what that means. I need to explore that a little further, but it's just something funny I've noticed online. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, I really like just kind of the commentary on, you know, each of these characters kind of setting their own fate. And you see a lot with the mob mentality is everyone just kind of assumes that what they want to happen or in the case of our main character uh, doesn't want to happen is going to happen. Um, so you see him like stumbling across, um, you know, the, the symbol or the, the skull that's on. Uh, I forget the, the girl that dies, uh, her leg and then, and then going to the bar and, oh, John Hurt has to be this guy. And then it turns out John Hurt is this guy. And then. Um, just getting framed for being the robber that's breaking into all these houses and just like how how quickly all the what do you call them like townspeople the angry mob um it's just like yeah this is our guy let's the townsfolk <laughs> um <Yeah>. just like <laughs> how everyone's trying to force everything into happening um uh out outside of the story while paul is just kind of watching in horror is everything he doesn't want to happen happens yeah, it's such it's, a it's good, so good send up of it's such a good send up of yuppie culture because even the one thing at the I the, I love the first scene because after the camera zooms through uh, all the cubicles and Paul Hackett is teaching the I guess like the intern or like the new guy to like how to like do all the document intake and whatnot and the guy's like man like this is only temporary because you know I just want to I just want to do things with my life you know I just like I want to be able to do publishing and actually make a difference and it's uh and it's just so funny I, I thought that that's like a perfect scene to like set up the tone for the rest of this and then cap capped off with the amazing ending where he's just ends up where paul hackett just ends up in his desk again and he's all dusty <laughs> from paper mache it's just it's perfect it's a great like you leave your everything that happens to you you leave that um at the door when you come into the work day and whatnot but also it's just Mm. hilarious it's a hilarious send up of that like oh i just want to do something with my life you know like i can't i can't just stay here and like being totally unaware of that privilege that comes with it it's just it's it's beautiful i love it 
No, I've seen The Wolf of Wall Street. I thought Marty was a pretty pro yuppie guy. Now you're telling me he's <laughs> maybe not on board with all this? Yeah, Jordan Belfort's actually a great guy. A lot of a lot of great <laughs> ideas. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure I understood that movie. <laughs> Uh, I still but, can't get over how everyone <laughs> thought that he was glorifying those kind of people in that movie, but that's that's another conversation for another day. Um, but yeah, it's just like everything about After Hours is satisfying. Like it, it just is. Like that's the best way I can summarize my experience. Yeah, it zips along. There's no fat on this movie. It's less than 100 minutes, then it's out, and then. That same guy would go on to make The Irishman, which is 10 <laughs> hours long. <laughs> Gotta love him. I love him. I mean, would Home Alone have even happened without this movie? Is Who Martin knows, Scorsese right? also responsible for that cinematic universe? So does that mean Scorsese caused Trump? Or because of Home Alone 2? Mm. You gotta think about that one. <laughs> Big butterfly effect here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was a good time um we've we've had some good picks um it was certainly a, a lot uh less tense than last week's movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah that that laugh a minute romp the hunt <laughs> oh god jokes were just coming at you but but yeah it was it was definitely a lot more lighthearted. um it was a fun shakeup. i i think we've had a pretty good array of of movies so far as we've made our second round um, or second circuit, I guess you could call it. We just have really good taste. That's all. Yeah, what you can know? you say? I like it. I think, uh, I think it's been a great addition to the podcast so far. And two rounds in, uh, I, I'm pretty satisfied. I think it's it's a fun exploration uh, for sure. And it just kind of makes for a, it makes for a good time. I, uh, I've got to say this, though. Both of my picks that I've had have been my least favorite out of like that rotation. Things were kind of interesting. Like both rounds, I've I I really didn't care for my pick like in this last round as much. But it's like both rounds. I was like, no, both of these other movies were better than the one I. Watched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if yeah, you like good recommendations, what can we say? <laughs> um. Yeah. So we'll be we'll be continuing that next week uh, with 1968's Steve McQueen's Bullet. Um, which is is streaming on HBO Max, and then is uh, a movie that I bought when Family Video died a while ago, and has been sitting on my shelf waiting to be opened. So, I'll be looking forward to that. We got Mortal Kombat coming out. It's a pretty big week. Cinema, it's tough. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Oscars next week too. Here we go. Yeah. yeah, so much, so much cinema. I'm ready. Cannot wait for Green Book to pick up a second Best Picture win. <laughs> Uh, what a twist what a twist um, driving miss daisy returns <laughs> win. Uh, but yeah so that is this week's episode of the movie bible podcast we'll be back next week talking about mortal Kombat, talking about bullet um probably getting in some last minute oscar opinions uh if, if not anything else um so remember you can always check us out online at moviebabble.com 